the champ returned and restored order to the Kentucky Derby picture. That and so much more on this episode of the Win Place Show. Salutations and welcome, horse racing fans. I'm your host to this episode of the Win Place Show. My name is Matthew DeSantis, and you can find me on Twitter at the handle at Failed to Menace. Well, like I said, welcome here to the Win Place Show. And before we get into what was an eventful week of horse racing, make sure to press that subscribe button on YouTube to get all of our great content here on Trust the Profits, not just the Win Play Show, but all of the other content we have, whether it's graded stakes previews, whether it's cap in the card, whether it's the Thursday night lounge, whether it's doubling down, whether it's full field rundowns. We have so much content, whether it be about the Kentucky Derby or other races in the sport make sure to press that subscribe button. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at the handle at Failed to Menace. Make sure to give this video a like and let me know what was your biggest wow performance or what was your biggest takeaway from the weekend in the comments below. Well, like I said, it was a huge weekend in the sport, and I want to start this recap by just saying thank you again to my guests that I had on th over the last week. So many people to thank. Angela Herman down at Gulfstream Park, much appreciated being the guest on Cap in the Card. Caitlin Free in the Bataglia Memorials preview, and particularly Jess Pfeiffer. Uh, real big thanks to her uh, for the Santa Anita Graded Stakes preview as well. So many thanks to those guests. We always try to bring on wonderful guests here on Trust the Profits to make sure that you have as good a coverage as possible going into those races. Well, speaking of... Some of the content, I want to talk a little bit about Gulfstream Park, and that's where we're going to start. No sense burying the lead, right? And that is going to the Fountain of Youth and what we saw from Forte in his return to the track after four months away. We have not seen Forte since that impressive victory in the Grade 1 Breeders' Cup Juvenile where he dispatched of Cave Rock and National Treasure and all of the other juveniles that were running that day. But Forte comes back, and there were questions lingering, of course. How was he going to look? I was a little skeptical. Uh, I was still bullish to some extent. I was still bullish on Forte long term. I still had him as kind of my number one derby contender. But I thought to myself, you know something? This is a, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And it's not about whether you win the Fountain of Youth. It's about whether you're ready for the Kentucky Derby. And so I just thought, you know, maybe he's not 100% cranked up coming out of the box. Well, if he wasn't 100% cranked up, he sure gave the impression that he was because he returned to the track and looked dominant. And this was the type of performance that we've been waiting for from these top contenders on the Derby trail. And we, quite frankly, have really not been getting. I mean, maybe you could make an argument that a horse like Instant Coffee has answered the bell several times, which he has. Uh, and so that's certainly a horse to consider. Maybe you like, a, a, you know, some other horses out there. Arabian Knight, obviously very impressive in that Southwest. But to see Forte return, set a perfect trip behind the early speed of Cyclone Mischief and Mage was out there and Rocket Can was out there. Uh, and so you had these horses kind of pretty forwardly placed, although it was not a particularly aggressive pace. I think 41, four, uh, 24 flat, 47 and four opening half. So they weren't exactly flying around the Gulfstream Park track, but Forte just kind of sat in that position. Irad did the right thing. He was kind of, he could tell that Cyclone Mischief was going to start backing up a little bit on the inside rail. And so what did he do? Listen, he knew he had the best horse. He just swung out wide, went four wide, hit the top of the stretch, and then pulled away and was able to even gear the horse down a little bit towards the end. So Forte, so impressive coming back, earning a 98 buyer speed figure and really moving the needle and basically announcing to the rest of the three-year-old crop, I am the number one derby contender with a bullet. It's hard to make a case against Forte at this point. He's you know, gone against horses like Loggins in a, a great stretch run. He's gone up against the California horses at the Breeders' Cup and dispatched of them. And now you're seeing him go against the horses down in Florida off of a long layoff. It's so impressive. Now, I will say... The word after the race was that he will remain in Florida. 
Uh, he will stay in Florida and he will run in the Florida Derby, which is great news for me because your boy here is going down to the Florida Derby. So I'm going down with, along with my fellow Trust the Profits colleague, El Hombre. Uh, the two of us are headed down to Gulfstream Park for the Florida Derby. So I'm excited to see him there. I'll try to maybe ask Forte a few questions, maybe ask Todd Pletcher a few questions for him uh, while I'm down there. And so that should be a lot of fun. But there was some speculation that Forte may move to the bluegrass and you know, go up to Keeneland. He likes that track, obviously likes that surface a great deal. One in the Breeders' Futurity, one at the Breeders' Cup. Uh, but Pletcher said, listen, if he handles the track well, he's going to stay in Florida. He clearly handled the track well. So the plan is to stay in Florida for the Florida Derby. Well, let's talk about some other participants in this race. Rocket Can came out with, a, I think, a very solid second place finish and showed nice progression. Likely will earn about a 93, 94 buyer speed figure from this effort, which I think is really pretty solid. A lot of people were down on Rocket Can after winning that Holy Bull and only posting an 82 buyer speed figure was not that visually impressive in terms of the speed of the race, yet came back second off the bench. I, I made this point at the time. I said, you know, okay, I get why people are critical of uh, that Holy Bull race, but Rocket Can is now second off the bench. You know, that was the first time off the bench performance. Second off the bench, what do we see? Oh, a 10-point progression in beast speed figures. Not surprising. Now, do I think Rocket Can is good enough to beat the upper echelon of the three-year-old crop? Probably not. But I think he announced himself as, at the very least, a serious derby horse and one that is, you know, practically guaranteed now a spot in the starting gate. So something to keep in mind there. Cyclone Mischief, nice bounce back performance. It kind of surprisingly went to the lead. Uh, and, and that was, I think, probably the right move. I mean, faded a little bit to third, but I thought was, uh, you know, like I said, showed much more uh, competitive fire. I thought much better showing than what we saw out of him in the Holy Bull. And then Mage, Held on for fourth. It was kind of an interesting race for Mage, who I think a lot of us just assumed was going to go to the lead uh, because he does have that early speed. He ended up rating uh, kind of most of the race and kind of was sitting a little wide and kind of forwardly placed, but not on the lead. And so it was interesting to see the ride he ended up with finishing a fourth uh, place finish. I, I think he's a good horse. I, I be interested if they come back in the Florida Derby, but I think at the very least you realize he's not just this one hit wonder who just pops a big number on debut and can't back it up. I mean, finished it, like I said, a competitive fourth there uh, at the Fountain of Youth. Now, the horse that was absolutely nowhere to be seen was Blazing Sevens, who was also making a return from uh, a long layoff of four months. Last ran also in the Breeders' Cup uh, against Forte, but Blazing Sevens was nowhere to be seen. Dropped anchor early, and uh, pretty obvious he was not fully cranked up. There was an interview on TVG Fan Duel TV with Chad Brown earlier in the day, and Chad made it very clear well before the race was run that that Blazing Sevens was not cranked up for this race. This was more of just like a leg stretcher almost, and we'll see what ends up happening. So, uh, you know, I'm sure he'll come back, um, and I'm sure the works will get a little bit more aggressive now uh, that he's gotten this one race under him, but it was not surprising. I think that's why a lot of us were going to longer shots. I think that's why you saw a lot of us going to a horse like General Jim, who ended up scratching, and I'll talk more about him in a second. But you, what you saw him go to some other options because if you could get past Forte, then there were a slew of prices available for you because everybody went right past Blazing Sevens. So again, from a betting standpoint, I understand why people kind of wanted to get past Forte, who was a below even money favorite and, and, and ran like it, by the way, ran super impressively, ran like you would hope a three to five favorite would end up running. Well, let's talk about the rest of the Saturday Gulfstream card, and it was packed, but it was a mixed bag for favorites, so Forte closed things out in style at the end, but leading up to that, it was a little bit of a mixed bag for horses that went off as huge morning line or post-time favorites, I should say. Maybe the most notable loss on the card was, of course, Charge It in the Gulfstream Park Mile, the heavy favorite who went off, I believe, at 2-5 to five and was actually defeated by Endorsed. Endorsed is a horse that has been on quite a roll, coming off that win in the grade three, Fred Hooper, now coming back winning this. It's interesting. Endorsed, I believe, has won three or four races in a row now. And if I'm not mistaken, Endorsed won like six for his previous 32 races. So <laughs> he's on a roll. I mean, this is not a horse that racked up a lot of wins throughout most of his career. And so now suddenly you're seeing the seven-year-old really running the best of his life, ran a huge speed figure. Uh, I think it ran a 101 buyer speed figure. Uh, and so charge it finishing second. I mean, 
it was an interesting race to watch in that they went very pedestrian that first quarter mile. And then they really sped up in the second quarter mile so that the half mile fraction was considerably faster than what you would have projected based upon the first quarter. And Charge It just was never comfortable the whole way. He was kind of sitting off of Octane and and then endorsed was just kind of hounding him and pressuring him on the outside. And Pletcher made this point afterwards. Charge It is still a very young horse and still getting used to horse racing and and the dynamics of horse racing. And you could tell that Charge It just wasn't comfortable necessarily with the way the race shape played out. You could just watch the way he was running and you could tell something was off, not physically off, but you could just tell the horse was either agitated or worked up or bothered by perhaps the presence of endorsed on his outside, being between horses, etc. But ultimately when they came turn for home, endorsed was able to take the lead, charge it, uh finish second. My favorite horse, Simplification, came kind of running up for third. Uh, I was glad to see that. I, I mean, I think Simplification is a horse that obviously probably has gotten too much airtime for the his finishes based upon uh, on this show. But I still love talking about him because he's a cool horse. And I'm glad they turned him back to a one-turn mile because uh, I think that is where he is best. He kind of came running late uh, to get a piece of the board and finish third. And that's kind of what simplification does. He, he hits the board. He's an honest horse. He's going to collect paychecks. Uh, don't expect him to win much, but I do like him to hit the board a lot. So uh, he, it's good to see him, I think, back at the right level. Uh, I think grade one is probably too much. I think grade two might even be a little too much. Uh, I love to see him in kind of grade three listed stakes company in a one turn mile. And I'd also like to see him get a little bit of a rest, but he looked fresh coming in there at the end. So Pletcher said regarding charge it that no plans have changed just because he finished second the net mile is still the goal a long-term goal looks like they're going to go to the oak lawn handicap after this I, like i said pletcher said there's nothing that indicated to him that they would want to go in another direction so keep that in mind moving forward now one of the favorites that almost got beat was emmanuel but it was not because of the horse it was because of the ride uh, emmanuel was much the best in that turf stakes race and just was bottled up and had nowhere to go. And it was just a, kind of a not, a, I don't want to be too hard on the jockey because it wasn't as if it was a bad ride necessarily, but it was just the way the race still played out. Emmanuel was just boxed in, in, you know, behind horses and just between horses and just could not get out in the clear. Finally got out in the clear. Uh, and once he got out in the clear, he was fine. Uh, and he ended up winning and really kind of, uh, you know, striding uh, so gracefully those last, you know, half furlong to a furlong and surging past steady on in the last few strides. A really impressive horse. Again, you know, the, the trouble with the trip, not really getting out into the clear until very late. Finally, uh, being able to kind of push the button and you saw the horse explode coming down the stretch for the win. But uh, again, another heavy favorite there who was in some trouble. Again, the horse fired. That wasn't the issue. The issue is just the ride. I want to also say an impressive transition for Emmanuel. Um, this is a horse that was on the Derby Trail last year. This is a horse that I believe finished third at the Bluegrass to Zandon and Tis the Bomb. This is a good horse. And... Todd Pletcher kind of knew this was a turf horse the whole time and eventually just transitioned to the turf. And he, what's he done? He's gone out and he's just won graded stakes races on the turf. And he's become one of our better turf horses in this country, uh, which, which might not be saying much, but he really is. And so a uh, very impressive look forward to seeing what's next for him uh, in terms of where he continues to go, where he continues to oppress. Imagine he'll be down at Gulfstream Park for at least the next race, but interested to see him going up to Saratoga, hopefully this summer and Belmont after that. So we'll be exciting to see. Um, now let's talk a little bit about another Todd Pletcher turf horse, which is going to definitely be in a graded stakes races next time out. And that is the horse up to the mark who was super impressive in one of the early races, race three in an allowance race, and just unleashed an absolutely devastating turn of foot late. This was a horse that was on the dirt for a while. They transitioned to the turf, threw up a huge, huge speed figure, first time on the turf in a low-level allowance, stepped up to a higher-level allowance, and just blew away the competition, made it look so easy. This is clearly a horse that has found his preferred surface, and I can't wait to see what comes next for up to the mark, but a very, very impressive horse uh, who, who delivered early in the card for Todd Pletcher. 
Well, let's go to one of the other big favorites on the card who did deliver, and that was White Abario, uh, running in that high-level allowance race in the middle of the card, uh, You know, coming back from that rather disappointing grade one effort in the Pegasus World Cup. White Abario comes back against allowance company, and just, he's the class. You know, I made this point on capping the card. He was just the class of the field, and there was really no doubt about that. And that's exactly what you saw late in particular, uh, that he just kind of pulled away. And it was, you know, the class wins out at some point, and you just go, that's just a better horse than everybody else in the race. Uh, and White Abario got that win. Always feel good for C2 Stables. They are truly a great force, I think, in horse racing. Anybody who follows them on social media knows they donate so much money to get horses out of bad situations once they're off the track. And I I cannot say enough about them as an organization, how much respect I have for them. Again, it's a reason why a lot of people like White Abario. It's not just because he's a gray horse. It's not just because, you know, people kind of fanboy out over that stuff. It's because of the connections. Uh, he's a very, very special horse, and uh, he, and he's, he runs for a very special group of people at C2. So uh, definitely happy for them to get the win. Now, the craziest thing that I saw in that race was the amount of money that came in on High Oak. Listen, High Oak was coming off a one-year layoff had been injured in the Fountain of Youth in 2022, comes back to run on the undercard in 2023, had not run since, okay, had not run in a year, comes back, opens up as the five to two or three to two favorite early money. Are you kidding me? Ends up going off at three to one, which was still way too high. Morning line, eight to one horse. And High Oak, listen, he gave you a thrill for the first half, for, you know, first half mile. The first four furlongs, he's right there. And then he just completely dropped anchor, as you would expect, by the way, a horse coming back from a year-long layoff. I have no idea why people were betting high oak in that race. That just made no sense to me at all. Uh, you know, I understand wanting to potentially play against White of Barrio. Uh, I, I get that. But, and I think there were some options if you wanted to play against White of Barrio. But high oak just did not seem like one of those options to me. Uh, that was just, uh, you know, I... I I, I typically when I see those double lines in the past performances, meaning that it's over a year layoff, unless there is an incredibly compelling trainer angle, unless there is incredibly compelling workouts, I, that's typically like a toss. Now that doesn't mean the horse won't run well, but it's typically a toss from a win standpoint and high Oak. Uh, like I said, I'll be interested. I, I root for the horse. I pointed that out on capping the card. I, I'm excited to see him back on the track. Hope he runs better next time. And I'll be interested to see where he ends up going. Well, one of the other favorites that did not deliver, uh, and this was, you know, more in the realm of charge it, was Cairo Consort and the Here Comes the Bride. But let me tell you, that was a thrilling race, and she was definitely a part of it at the very end. Uh, she, you know, sat mid pack this time, got away much better than the last time when she blew the break, had the right si type of setup, finally got out clear, and was making that run late, but just could not track down the eventual winner, Dance Macabre. Cabra and uh, and Papilio, and it was a kind of a it wasn't a photo. It was very obvious. Dance Macabra won. Papilio finishing second. Cairo Consort finishing third. But the three of them were separated by a head. A very very close race. But Cairo Consort, you know, that was a horse I really liked, and I picked in capping the card. This gets into this discussion about a lot of people are talking about fair odds now. You know, so it's like, oh, I picked this horse to win. Okay, but what odds do you want to use that horse? And Cairo Consort went off at two to five, three to five in that race. And it's just like, I, I, I don't like her at that price at all. And so from a betting standpoint, when I see a horse like Cairo Consort, who is a nice horse, and I really like her as a filly a lot, but I don't like her in a graded stakes race with some good horses in there, obviously, below even money like that. That just, ugh. No, <laughs> when I saw that. I was like, oh, no way. I'm bad betting Cairo Consort there. Um, you know, Papilio was really the more intriguing horse to me then uh, once I saw how the lines ended up playing out. And it really played off. Papilio came in off the bench for eight months, making the transition over here to the United States, having never run in the United States. This is where knowing international racing is really important because all you have to do to know how Papilio was going to run was to look at who Papilio faced last time out, which was Taria and Meditate. And those two are dominant, dominant horses. And the fact that she was keeping that sort of company overseas tells you everything you need to know about the quality of this horse and what the previous connections thought of her. And so 
yeah, she came up second. She came up a bit short, but she was floating up the board and she was five to one morning line and was floating up. And, and that just didn't seem right. I mean, she was a, certainly a useful horse to use in verticals uh, at that point coming off the huge layoff. But credit to uh, Kelsey Danner and uh, uh, Dance Macabre. That was the second big win for Kelsey on the day, actually. Won the opening race with Smokin' Jay at 9-1. to one, And that was one Angela and I gave you uh, on capping the card. It's funny. Angela and I gave out a couple of monster trifectas early in the in the card uh, in race one and in race four. Uh, we gave out a 270 to one trifecta in the first race and a 190 to one trifecta in the in the fourth race. So we were all over that <laughs> early on. So if you paid attention to the captain of the card early, you did well. Late, eh, we got a little cool late because we were trying to, I think, sometimes beat favorites who ended up winning or try to use favorites who ended up getting beat, Cairo Consort being an example of that. One of those things. Now, arguably the biggest upset of the day took place in the Devona Dale, which was the Kentucky Oaks prep race with Dorth Vader winning at 46 to one. Now, again, if you listen to capping the card, you heard us talk about the fact that this was going to be a race with a lot of speed. And indeed it was a crazy fast pace, red carpet ready could just simply not keep up with that pace. Again, red carpet ready at even money. No, thank you. Uh, I like that horse. I didn't pick that horse, but I like that horse. But at even money, I don't like any of these fillies at even money uh, in this uh, Oaks division right now, maybe with the exception of wet paint. But it, and, and that's only if it's raining outside. But what I'll say is uh, Red Carpet Ready, I thought, did hold on gamely to finish third in that race. Really was the only horse who was on the near the early speed who held up. And, and still finished without like completely finishing totally far back. I think the biggest disappointment in the race was probably undervalue asset, the Chad Brown horse, as well as leave no trace. Uh, those two just really uh, fell back late and were just victims of the pace and just didn't have anything coming for home, uh, finished last and second to last in, in that race. So those two certainly not great performances there, uh, particularly after some promising performances last time out from both of them. But again, Dorth Vader, 46 to 1, earns those Kentucky Oaks points. Big time win there. Uh, Guns and Graces, another Chad Brown horse who's a gun runner, came up flying late. Uh, we told you it was going to be horses picking up the pieces late that you wanted to look at. Dorth Vader definitely fit that description of 46 to 1. Hope people got a big price on that one. Uh, if you did, congratulations. But it was a big day in general at Gulfstream for Chad Brown, who also had um, My Lady and Faith in Humanity as stakes winners. We've been talking about, you know, where is Chad Brown? He's running up at Aqueduct a little bit, but this was kind of his announcement. I'm back. You know, he he's, he's back on the circuit. He's got his stable ready to go. And so uh, he's doing quite well there with My Lady and Faith in Humanity. Huge day for Todd Pletcher, obviously, with Forte Emanuel up to the mark, as well as Dude in Colorado winning a stakes race, uh, the Colonel Liam as well. Well, let's move to New York and what was just chaos. I'll just say chaos. And I'll just start by saying, in an unsurprising turn of events, it was uh, not great track conditions at Aqueduct in the winter. Uh, it was a muddy sealed track. Welcome to New York. Uh, and it is just, you know, it's one of those things where it's hard to extrapolate out sometimes uh, how horses are going to run when conditions are off track. Now that uh, I don't mind horses running on an off track, I actually really like handicapping off track races, but it does make the extrapolation process a little bit more difficult when you start talking about how are they going to perform in the Oaks in the Derby if conditions are much better there. Are they just a creature of a steel track? Are they a creature of muddy conditions? Are they a creature who can handle a dry, fast track as well? These are questions that are not going to be answered anytime soon because it continues to have miserable weather in New York. Um, but we'll start with the Busher Invitational, which was the, the Kentucky Oaks prep race. And this is one, again, big day for Chad Brown with Sheeta Beauty beating stablemate Asset Purchase. Now, Asset Purchase was the four to five post time favorite. Like I said, Muddy Sealed Track, one turn mile. And it was a fascinating race in that Asset Purchase was sitting in kind of a perfect stalking position the whole way. And then pulled away, started pulling away from the field around the far turn or coming out of the fourth turn without even being asked really. And you think, oh, this is going to be a romp. You know, asset purchase is just going to roll basically because she's drawing off without being asked for anything from the jockey. They get the stretch, the, you know, put the horse down in terms of just you know, really kind of asking something from, uh, from her. 
And it seems like maybe she's a little distance compromised because she started to just get a little tired late. You know, the stride started to shorten up a little bit. And don't you know, the stable mate, Sheeta Beauty, starts coming and just tracking her down in the middle of the track, coming, 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 and eventually getting there and, and winning the Busher Invitational. So a big win there for Sheeta Beauty. Uh, and I mentioned that she's coming down the middle of the track. Again, anybody who follows Aqueduct knows Asset purchase was on the inside rail. Sometimes the rail is dead. Sometimes the rail is golden. Sometimes the middle of the track is where you want to be. Sometimes it isn't. Again, it depends on the weather. Now, I don't think asset purchase was hindered by track conditions necessarily. I think this is more of just maybe this horse wants seven furlongs, six furlongs. Maybe he's more of a sprinter. Um, Sheeta Beauty looked very good, uh, very impressive uh, in that performance. So uh, congrats to her and the connections. Again, another big win for Chad Brown. But that was all setting up the Gotham, which was absolutely bonkers. Because at the gate, as soon as the gates open, how great is Nate loses jockey J.D. Acosta. And we have a riderless horse that the outriders are not able to get to, partially because of that far inside post position, number two post. And so... There was a challenge for them to get to in the first place. Never got to him. This was wild because how great is Nate then kicks outside without a rider and circles the field. Okay. As you would expect a riderless horse to do. Now here's the thing <laughs> and, and credit to the training. I mean, how great is Nate? God bless this horse because this horse runs like a race horse should run even when there's no rider because once he circles the field, he saves ground and tucks inside to the rail. And so, which you almost never see. Typically, when there's a riderless horse, they're running wide the entire way. And the outriders are eventually able to get them. How great is Nate gets past everybody and then promptly moves over about three paths inside and is now on the inside rail going around the far turn and coming for home. And it creates this sense of confusion where the horse is on the lead you know, you wonder how much they're pushing their horses to keep going or how much they're trying to be cautious of this riderless horse that's in front of them now and kind of in their path to get there. Now, there was also very aggressive pace. So those horses up front were starting to to certainly get weary uh, at that point. But hard to think that how great is Nate did not have an impact on the way this race turned out. Ultimately, though, out of the clouds, long shot Ray's Kane, who is a turfway shipper for Ben Colebrook, more on him in a second, but that was a huge effort from Ray's Kane, 23 to one, had been running on the synthetic, and again, comes down the middle of the track. Why do I make that point? Because where's how great is Nate on the inside of the track? And so all those horses on the inside, I think, were a little wary of what's going on with how great is Nate. The horse on the outside, though, they're clear, and they're come flying. So Ray's Kane comes flying for the win. Slip Mahoney, who was my top pick, ends up coming up late for second place. And then General Banker, who if you read my article on Odds Checkers US, I told you to use General Banker in the trifecta at 30 to 1. General Banker hits the trifecta because that's what General Banker does. Uh, he's a little bit like a lesser version of simplification. He just cashes checks. Um, but here's the thing. Can we take anything out of this race? <sighs> Hard to. Uh, not only is it a one-turn mile, which automatically makes it a little bit more difficult to take seriously in terms of this late in the derby season, there's also the element of the, the muddy conditions, the sealed track, but then the riderless horse really throws everything off. Now, congrats to Ray's Kane, 23 to 1. Like I said, big winner for Penn Colebrook, who actually saddled Ray's Kane, then hopped on a flight and went down to Turfway Park so he could saddle another horse running in the Pataglia that we're going to talk about here in a second. But it's not surprising Ray's Kane ran well. Synthetic horses tend to run well on wetter tracks and, and off-track conditions on dirt. So not surprising to see a horse that had been running on synthetic really take to the track conditions of an aqueduct. Um, is Ray's Kane a serious derby threat? I, not re I don't think so. But with 50 Kentucky Derby points now, pretty much a guaranteed a spot in the Kentucky Derby gate if Ben Krolbrook wants to go that direction with him. So congrats to the connections, obviously. But moving on, we are going to move out west where there was lovely weather. Uh, although, luckily this week, last week it was a disaster. But uh, lovely weather out at Santa Anita. And just talk a little bit about the Buena Vista. Congrats to Quatroel, who won very close race over Macadamia. Uh, Jessica Pfeiffer and I both really like Macadamia, who gave you a little bit of a price. And 
everything Jessica said played out. You know, Tiago Pereira is on that horse, and it looks like a different horse with him aboard. And Macadamia seems to have gotten over any issues he has with passing horses. Uh, so that horse really can go, or she can go, I should say. And uh, and so she passed everybody on the inside, and then Quatrell comes running late on the outside. You could tell Macadamia just didn't see her until she was passed and then digs in and tries to keep going. Um, but ultimately Quatroel, who is the morning line and post time favorite gets the win there. Kitty Katana pulled up early reports are that she is okay. Uh, but she was pulled up abruptly going around the third turn. Well, let's move to the San Felipe, which is the kind of not the headliner necessarily. Cause that was the big cap that we're going to get to in a second, but San Felipe stakes, obviously the Kentucky Derby prep race. And this was the one everybody was eager to see. How are these Baffert horses going to run? Well, one of them scratched national treasure. And then the rest of them didn't really show up as I didn't think they were going to show up. If you listen to my uh, stakes preview with Jessica, she and I both liked, as we call it, the OG or the organic Tim Yachtin horse practical move and practical move showed what I was hoping practical move would show. This horse had been working lights out on the workout uh, tab, and I just thought this horse is working out too good and looks too good, and I thought there was going to be the perfect pace set up. Ultimately, there was, and, and by the way, J Jessica was totally right in that Hijazi went out first and go rocket ride despite flashing that incredible early speed and maiden debut, rated, sat back and sat behind Hijazi, stalking behind Hijazi, and practical move had the perfect trip sat there kind of in the pocket third fourth you know sitting in a nice trip and when it came time to hit the stretch hit the stretch it had the inside position was able to go up through the rail around the turn and then uh, see you later i mean practical move really showed that he's the he's the goods and he recorded a 100 buyer speed figure two points better than forte and again both of them were coming off extensive layoffs uh practical move have not run since the los alamitos futurity back in december so he was coming off his own layoff as well uh, i will say very impressed by go rocket ride who sat off of hijazi and then hijazi really kicked wide going around that final turn and impacted what go rocket ride did go rocket ride veers back inside ends up kind of re-rallying a little bit ends up holding on for second i thought a really strong effort posted a 96 buyer speed figure so a progression from that eye-popping maiden and then skinner comes up late for third nice really late charging horse there so practical move though it gets the uh, job done and uh, the richard mandela go rocket ride finishing second the baffert the former baffert horses the baftine horses or whatever you want to refer to them as not really there and this was, I, I know there were some people on Twitter who were really, oh, Baffert's got the best three-year-old crop. I always thought it was, well, I thought Brad Cox had a pretty good three-year-old crop and Todd Pletcher now looks like he's got a really good three-year-old crop, but it's interesting. I was always a little skeptical of Baffert's crop. If you go back and watch some of our early stuff that we were doing back when these horses were juveniles here on Trust the Profits, I kept mentioning a lot of these horses have a lot of sprinter pedigree. And I just don't know how much they're going to like two turns. I just don't know how much they're going to like to stretch out. And well, maybe they don't like stretching out quite as much as we thought they would. Uh, National Treasure, interestingly, was the one I thought probably would like stretching out the most. And uh, obviously, Scratch, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. We still had two other grade ones on the Santa Anita card, the Frank E. Kilroe Mile, uh, where Hong Kong Harry kind of flattened out a little bit and was very forwardly placed for him, typically a little bit further back. He was really sitting mid-pack and even a forward mid-pack trip. Jessica mentioned that he was a horse that was really ready to go, and you could kind of tell that he was really ready to run. It might not have been the best thing for him because he kind of flattened out coming in the stretch. Uh, and ultimately, Gold Phoenix, one of the other Phil D'Amato horses with Kazushi Kimura aboard, sneaks up the rail and gets him late to win a grade one. So congratulations to Kazushi Kimura, who's been riding, I think, really well out at Santa Anita after transferring from Woodbine. Uh, and DeJour, the Bob Baffert turf horse. You don't hear us say that very often, but comes running like heck for a second. Uh, and so that was a, a nice big payoff there in the Frankie Kilroy mile. Now in the in the final one, in the Santa Anita handicap, in the big cap, well, to my heart's delight, it was Stiletto Boy. Uh, this is a horse I absolutely love. I always love Stiletto Boy. Stiletto Boy runs super honest, super hard every single time. 
I just didn't think 10 furlongs was going to be his distance because he typically has shown that he is distance compromised. I've always thought a mile and a 16th, a mile and an eighth, that's where he's going to do his best work. I was I was thrilled that he was finished third at the Pegasus. I thought that was kind of his upward, his kind of ceiling uh, in that particular race. But man alive, did Kent DeSormo give him a ride. And some of it just happened by chance. Defunded and Hopper kind of moved over, and Kent DeSormo, you could tell, was not that thrilled uh, in the post-race interview, kind of moved over and took um, Stiletto Boy's path early on because Stiletto Boy was gearing towards the lead, as he always does, and he kind of got crossed over, and Stiletto Boy had to take up a little bit and rate, which is not something he typically does, but it turned out to be the best thing for him because, don't you know, it defunded and Hopper kind of go at it up front with pretty strong fractions. Now, a lot of people were complaining Mike Smith on Hopper. You know, they were upset because, you know, the two Baffert horses are wearing each other out. Listen, Hopper had kind of one way to win this race, and that was to be on the lead. Mike Smith's giving him the ride that he needs to give Hopper to be in the lead. It just so happens to fund is doing the same thing as well. Um, and so, you know, sometimes you're going to have that sort of cannibal situation where the two Baffert horses wear each other out. And that's a little bit what happened. And so turning for home, not surprising. Johnny Velasquez on proxy comes charging late. Stiletto boy kicks out into the clear and just starts gaining ground little by little. And you think, oh my God, Stiletto boy's gaining on defunded suddenly. And Defunded's there trying to hold on, and Stiletto Boy just keeps getting there, keeps getting there. And you think Proxy's going to be the one who gets there, but Stiletto Boy in that last 150 yards really puts on a push and gets there to win the grade one Santa Anita handicap. Thrilling race. So happy for Stiletto Boy. So happy for Ed Moser Jr. Uh, and really happy for Kent DeSormo, too. I mean, he has been through his trials and tribulations. And he talked about that after the race and he has been through his screw ups, uh, as he said, uh, and his debacles, I believe was the exact word he said. And he has been, and he's been honest about it the whole way. He's done some, you know, terrible things in the past and he's had his demons for sure. But when he rides, he is a true difference making jockey, in my opinion. And uh, he is a, he is a jockey who I pay attention to when I see him on a horse. Uh, some jockeys are interchangeable in my opinion. He is not one of those jockeys. Uh, when he is on the top of his game, he is as good as they get in a lot of instances. So uh, congratulations to them. And a big week for the DeSormo family in general, as Keith, of course, his brother and trainer, won with confidence game last week at the Rebel. So a big day there. Uh, but also the Pegasus coming back really strong, as you would imagine. But last Samurai, one last time out, or one next time out, I should say. White of Barrio wins next time out. Simplification finishes third in the grade two. Then you have Stiletto Boy winning. And who else is in the trifecta? Defunded and Proxy, who were also in the Pegasus. So that Pegasus is coming back actually a little bit better maybe than we gave it credit for. Well, we closed out an eventful day of racing with the Pataglia, where Congruent goes from turf to synthetic for Antonio Sanyo and Tammy Bobo and wins at a big price. And I mentioned that those names because those are the exact same connections of simplification, uh, the owner and the trainer. So it will be interesting to see. Bobo took simplification to the Derby last year. Will she get Derby fever and take congruent there this year? We'll see. Typically has been a turf horse. I was not that thrilled about congruent going into the race. I thought this was a horse that was trending the wrong direction against horses like Candidate and Major Dude. Granted, I thought this was maybe an easier spot, but I still didn't love uh, that particular. Uh, I didn't love this particular race for him. That said, incredibly fast fractions, uh, 22 and four, 45 and four opening quarter and a half. They set this race up for closers, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, and when you do that, you're going to set it up for some turf horses who have that great late turn of foot. And uh, congruent just blew by everybody. Uh, very impressive win there for Sonny Leone. Scooby Quando, I mentioned that we were going to circle back around Ben Colbrook. Well, Scooby Quando was the horse that Ben Colbrook left New York after Ray's Kane won to go down to Kentucky to saddle up. And Scooby Quando finished a very game second place. That was my top pick, I, you know, partially because the name, partially because I actually really like the horse. Uh, but finished a very game second there uh, for him. So a big day for the Ben Colbrook barn, a win in the Gotham, a second in the Bataglia, definitely Derby fever there in the Colbrook barn. And congratulations to them. Always great to see kind of smaller barns get their day to shine and, and get some opportunity to get on the big stage there. So really great to see that. 
Now, in some general horse racing news, as we kind of get close to finishing things up here on this episode of the Win Play Show, I mentioned General Jim scratched out of the um, Fountain of Youth, and he was scratched due to a cough that was developed. He missed a, a morning work. And Shug McGahey, though, said the horse is likely to return for the Florida Derby. So he is not off the Derby trail. He is still on the Derby trail. Shug even said if he's not ready for the Florida Derby, he'll be ready for one of the other preps. So he is very much so on the Derby trail. Shug wants to get this horse a race, basically, before the Kentucky Derby to try to get him in because he thinks he can do it. Um, it's important to point out, Shug McGahey is not a trainer who traditionally pushes horses to do things they don't want to do. Uh, he's a horse. He's a trainer who lets pe horses kind of run into shape. A lot of cases he doesn't often rush two year olds. He doesn't even rush three year olds a lot of times. And so to see him excited about wanting to get general Jim back out there on the track, maybe the owners have something to do with it. I don't know, but he seemed pretty eager to get general Jim back out there. It's important to point out he was the third choice on the morning line. Uh, so there is some talent there, uh, for general Jim. Now the news was not so good for national treasure scratched from the, San Felipe due to a bad back left leg issue. Not sure if it's a foot or a leg issue, but nevertheless, tenderness in that back left hind quarter area. And uh, that sounds a little bit more ominous. I would be surprised if National Treasure continues on the Derby trail. Obviously, Santa Anita Derby is the only other spot for him to go to before the Kentucky Derby. I doubt that really happens. So cross him off of your Derby trail, uh, it seems like. Now, I do want to give a shout out to Gemswick Park, uh, and she is a broodmare, but I want to give a shout out because she made for a very profitable day for me uh, in one of the races at Gulfstream Park with her offspring, Scotland, uh, for trainer Bill Mott, who won a maiden special weight. And if anybody listening out there has a stallion that they are looking to pair up with a broodmare, select Gemswick Park. Let me give you these statistics. She has had five foals that have run races. Three of them have won first time out. One of them finished second and one of them finished third. That is what I call some precocity underneath, ladies and gentlemen. Gemswick Park, talk about a brood bear that is quite successful. I will be interested to see uh, who potentially uh, she has been covered up by over the last year or two and who we might be expecting in the pipeline from her because she has demonstrated she gives birth to some really precocious young horses who are really good right out of the gate. Uh, so congrats to Scotland and uh, trainer Bill Mott on that big win. And congrats, of course, to Chemswick Park, the proud mother. Also wanted to give you an update. Japan has announced that 26 horses are going to compete in the Dubai World Cup coming up in all the various races in the Dubai World Cup, from the Dubai Turf to the Golden Shaheen to the Godolphin Mile to the UAE Derby and to the aforementioned and properly named Dubai World Cup. It is a who's who of Japanese racing from Pantalasa, who obviously just came off that big win in Saudi Arabia, Vindegard, uh, Seraphos, Lemon Pop, Red Lazelle, who finished 1-2 in the February stakes, Bathrat Lyon, uh, Perrier, who uh, won a uh, Kentucky Derby prep over in Japan as well. The UAE Derby is where uh, he's going to be running. And so this is, uh, you know, just a stacked group that's coming. Cafe Pharaoh, Crown Pride, Geoglyph, Jung Young Lightbolt, T.O. Keynes. Uh, all of these horses are going to be running there. I bring this up because Japan has had so much success internationally. And I get that we typically look over the Atlantic. We pay attention to what Aiden O'Brien has. We pay attention to what Charlie Appleby has. We pay attention to what John Gosden has. We should pay attention to what those guys have because they have phenomenal horses who come over and beat our brains in at the Breeders' Cup every year. But do not sleep and do not ignore on the Japanese any longer. They have a crew and they can run on dirt and they can run on turf. That's what's more dangerous. The Europeans, the Euros now, they just run on turf for the most part. It's rare to see them come over and run on the dirt. The Japanese can run on the dirt and they are a threat to American dirt racing and not in a negative way. I love it. I love that they're a threat, but I'll tell you right now, there's a few of them that if they came over here to the United States and ran regularly in the U S they would sweep up graded stakes competition here. Uh, I'm rooting for them because they're doing horse racing, horse racing the right way over in Japan. You always want to see the people who are doing things the right way succeed. And let me tell you something, they are succeeding. Well, just to finish up with the last bit of news, uh, we, this is last time we had the win play show cave rock and Faustin remained with Bob Baffert and are officially off the Derby trail. Hijazi being hurt. 
uh, or I'm sorry, National Treasure being hurt, Hijazi not liking the distance. Suddenly, that Bob Baffert fleet of horses, like I said, looking a little thin. Well, there's no good transition to this. And, and this was a very sad piece of news that we saw earlier this week. The death of uh, jockey Alex uh, Chenkari devastated the horse racing community, a, a really beloved rider. Uh, who's ridden at several different tracks up in the Midwest in particular, uh, leaves behind a fiance, two children, as well as an unborn child who was due in August. Um, such sad news, only 29 years old. Uh, there is a GoFundMe account to help his uh, widowed uh, fiance as well as, as his young children. Uh, I'm including the link to that GoFundMe page in the video to this. Uh, if you just look below in the video description, you'll be able to find that GoFundMe page there. Listen, if you have the means, by all means, try to donate if you can. I, I gave a few dollars earlier this week. I'll probably give a few uh, dollars again uh, later this week. But uh, it, it's certainly just tragic to see this. A lot of... Uh, untimely deaths in the sport. And that is very, very sad to see. Uh, sadly, it's something that uh, growing up, I used to be uh, connected to the world of professional wrestling and uh, work in that world a little bit. And unfortunately, I see the same sort of things there where uh, there's been a lot of people who've left us, left us too soon in that world. A lot of people that I knew and were good friends of mine uh, who are no longer here well before their time. Uh, and so very sad to see and certainly hoping uh, that uh, the fiance and, and Alex's unborn child and his two existing children uh, can find some peace and solace in his memory in the coming years. Uh, no good transition away from that topic, but I did want to bring that up because it's a serious one to, to discuss. Um, but it also emphasizes how important family is. And uh, anybody who watches this knows that the person who introduced me to sports, this sport and horse racing was my dad. Uh, and my dad is a character. I love my dad. I'll refer to him occasionally on these shows. But he does his own podcast, believe it or not. Uh, maybe it runs in the family. I don't know. But he has his own podcast called Books and Looks, where he reviews books and talks about what he's looking at in pop culture. It's a lot of fun. You can get it on any platform where you get your podcast, whether it's Apple or Spotify or any of the others. But it's called Books and Looks. And the reason I bring it up is he's got some great horse racing coverage in the last two episodes. A couple of weeks ago, he interviewed the author Fred McRae, from the, uh, who's the author of the book Broken, which was about the death of Aladar. Really great interview, great topic, really interesting uh, interview. Next week, not this current week, but the following week, he's going to have a wonderful new podcast with the author Mark Schrager about the book the first Kentucky Derby, and listen to this subtitle, 13 black jockeys, one shady owner, and the little red horse that wasn't supposed to win. Uh, and it's the first time uh, Mr. Schrager is doing a podcast interview. He's doing it with my dad on books and looks. If you're interested in horse racing history, check out those most two recent episodes, the one about Aladar and the uh, book broken and this one upcoming next week about the first Kentucky Derby should be a lot of fun. And uh, you can, a lot of people say my dad and I sound alike too. So if you're listening to it and it sounds like me, don't worry, it's just my dad. So what do we have coming up this week? Well, we got the Tampa Bay Derby coming up. That's the only prep race on the card, but we're going to have a ton of content. Me and Colin are going to do a first look. Tom's going to do you know, the formula is going to do a full field rundown. Got doubling down, capping the card. I'm going to have Barry Spears, who's going to be working at Tampa Bay uh, on the uh, on the Tampa Bay Derby card, joining me on capping the card. We're going to go through all of our races, but we're also going to have stakes previews of the Beholder Mile out at Santa Anita, the only grade one on the card. So, so much great coverage. Make sure to subscribe to Trust the Profits here on YouTube. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at the handle at Failed to Menace. Well, until next time, friends, my name is Matthew DeSantis, wishing you a great and profitable day at the races and reminding you that it's now post time.